So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thanks for joining. We're very happy to host the 28th edition of the networking channel. As you know, in the networking channel, we do address very deep technical topics related to the future of the internet, but also we enjoy broadening up to other topics that are related to the transformative impact of the internet in the society. And today, this is a very good illustration of our general interest. Uh, the topic which we are going to address is about the transforming challenges of the internet governance. It does, the governance internet, the internet governance, sorry, it does address topics related to the management of internet technical resources, but also very important topics related to capacity building, to policy development, to human rights, to consumer rights, and at the time of uh, uh, an important international uh, development of uh, the situation, it is uh, even more important to address issues related to internet uh, uh, diplomacy. So we're very happy today that uh, we have uh, this uh, uh, program for the networking channel. I would like to remind you that uh, the program is recorded. So you can uh, watch it on our YouTube uh, channel. There is also a Slack channel that you can join at uh, the end of the event in case you would like to continue the conversation. And uh, of course, you are most welcome to ask questions using the Q&A. And this being said, I would like to hand over to Miriam and Vint. I would like to thank them uh, together with uh, Jim and uh, our distinguished panelists for organizing this event. And uh, Miriam and Vin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Serge. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> I don't know what time uh, you are. Uh, thank you, Serge and Jim, for uh, organizing uh, this uh, networking cha channel and uh, providing us with the opportunity to have uh, this um, panel uh, discussion uh, today on the transforming challenges of uh, internet governance. And um, I'm co-organizing this uh, panel with uh, Vint, uh, Vint Cerf, who is Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist Google, also uh, probably best known as the father of the, of the internet or, or one of them, I don't know. Uh, the, our co-panelists uh, today are Robin Mansell, who is a professor emerita, not emeritus, emerita at the Department of Media and Communication at the London School of Economics in uh, the UK and Political Science in the UK, and uh, Jan A. Scholte, uh, who is professor of Global Transformation uh, and Governance Challenges at Leiden University in the in the Netherlands. Myself, I'm a now, since uh, the 1st of October, um, an independent uh, expert in uh, global internet governance and digital rights. And before, I was a Serge colleague uh, at the Lipsis Laboratory, and I uh, was a senior researcher with the CNRS, which is the French uh, Scientific um, uh, Center for uh, Public Research. So uh, today we are very happy to discuss uh, with you. I uh, suspect you are not uh, our usual uh, audience, but this is uh, a very uh, multidisciplinary uh, topic and we are happy to discuss with you uh, what are uh, current uh, issues and still unresolved issues um, um that are really highly sensitive in terms of global internet governance challenges and how uh, this um, transformation of these uh, challenges uh, unfold uh, to impact especially national uh, sovereignty international re relations and the global uh, political economy so I will make a brief introduction of the topic, then I will hand over to Vint and our other panelists. Actually, the title of this panel is about the transforming challenges of internet governance, because internet governance and its challenges are not new. And to the best of my knowledge, 
the earliest reference to uh, internet governance was um, made almost 25 years ago. Uh, yes, I'm getting on. And uh, this uh, references was uh, uh, to internet governance as a political issue, uh, date uh, back to 1998, when uh, two international civil society uh, conferences uh, explicitly named the concept and put it on the global uh, political uh, agenda. And these two conferences, I think uh, Vint uh, might, uh, might remember these conferences. One of them was at the INET conference in 1998, organized by the Internet Society. And the other is the CPSR conference, Computer Professional for Social Responsibility. It was a very, very active um, association at that time. And um, during the, this conference, the CPSR conference, um, one of the keynote speaker was Lawrence Lessing at the time in 1998. And he gave a keynote speech, which was uh, actually the a preview of its uh, famous book that was published a year after, Codes and the, uh, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace. And you probably know Lawrence Lessing is a very renowned, uh, renowned uh, scholar. And uh, when if you hear that uh, code is law, this is uh, what he's talking about in this uh, seminal uh, book. At the same year, 1998, saw so the creation of the ICANN for the management of the Internet Corporation for Assigned Name and Numbers, for the management and the governance of the domain name system and other critical uh, internet resources. Uh, before this uh, function, this spe specific uh, function, this uh, so-called the IANA function, if you if you know a bit the the area, were managed by a single um, person, uh, but not any <laughs> not anyone. It was a very famous uh, person, John Postel, who uh, managed the domain name system at that time. Interestingly, still in 1998, the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, which is a, a United Nations agency, uh, held its plenipotentiary conference and adopted the same year, 1998, a resolution to that led to the organization of the first United Nations summit dedicated to what was called at the time the information society, uh, but still on internet issues, etc. And this summit was held in 2003 in two steps, 2003 and 2005. Now from 1998 to nearly 2005, the, the uh, the final um, uh, meeting of the the, the summit. Um, what was prevailing it was a rather restrictive uh, vision of internet governance concerning only or um, almost only the internet infrastructure, the internet protocols, and the internet uh, standards. This was the vision that was predominating at that time. It took uh, almost a decade to come up with an institutionalized uh, definition of internet governance, and this definition was provided after uh, long discussions and controversies, etc. It was provided by the United Nations WSIS, World Summit on the Information Society, in a document called the Tunis Agenda, because this session was held in, in Tunis, Tunisia. So the definition is, uh, is uh, the following one, quoting, Internet governance is the development and application by governments, the private sector, and civil society in their respective roles, respective roles of shared principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures, and program that shape the evolution and use of the internet. This is a very good definition, still applicable, 
it is very good good because it, it it says it all and it contains also all the controversies that um, uh, are happening si since then so first of all development and application by governments the private sector and civil society so this is the institutionalization and the recognition of the multi-stakeholder feature of internet governance it's not only it was a u.n summit but the u.n summit opened it up to um, beyond uh, state na nation states and beyond governments to the private sector companies etc and to civil society afterwards we this was extended to uh, other groups like international organizations like academics like the technical community recognized as such and not only as part of civil society etc the second important uh, wording in this definition is in their respective roles meaning because this definition was adopted by governments after all and they they wanted to open up the discussion on internet governance but not that much the decision should remain to them uh, governments so each category or each uh, uh, yeah category of uh, participant each kind of stake of, of stakeholder should um, remain within you know its uh, respective role and the third very important word in this definition is of shared principle norms rules decision making procedures and program so we all stakeholders were uh, called upon uh, adopting shared by consensus shared principle norms rules decision making procedures and program now these details principles norms rules, decision making procedure and programs um, are there to mean that internet governance is not only to govern the technical aspects of the internet infrastructure protocol domain names whatever standards technical standards etc but also to govern uh, the regulation of uh, different uh, issues, uh, as uh, Serge said in the in the introduction. So um, yeah, uh, yeah, I think I should uh, stop um, very soon. Uh, this the definition uh, may, uh, applies then to all kinds of regulation, including the technical uh, regulation that could be done as we see every day in our use of social networks and of um, platforms, could be done through predictive algorithm, etc. Uh, now, um, we are interested in global internet governance. Uh, meaning that uh, international or transnational aspects of the governance are especially of interest to, to us. And uh, we see them, as um, uh, Serge uh, already said, we can see them as a diplomatic uh, issue that is very interesting to conceptualize all the research question in the framework of internet national uh, relation and this is a good way to address very complex mutation that we are observing in international politics uh, that are characterized by uh, their highly technical uh, feature i think i will um, hand over the floor to to vint and then i could uh, provide some more uh, insight in the discussion maybe so vint please well, thank you so much, Miriam. That was a lovely historical review, uh, and I really appreciate that long perspective. Uh, uh, let me just begin by uh, admiring the problem that we have uh, in front of us. Standards are super important because they offer interoperability, and that creates uh, a lot of opportunity for competition and creation of new products and services. We rely on the Internet Engineering Task Force, the World Wide Web Consortium, ITUT, IEEE, and others uh, to help create those standards so that things will enter work. Uh, a second uh, area of challenge has to do with accessibility, and I mean this in two senses. One of them is simply access to the Internet. Is it available? Can I, uh, can I get access to it at all? 
And the other one is accommodation for people with disabilities. This is a very difficult topic, but it's a very important one. Uh, everyone uh, who is assisted uh, to get access to the internet uh, is actually also assisted to interact with all the other people in the world. And so it's not just the billion people with disabilities, but it's the other 7 billion people that need to work with them that are benefited by that kind of accommodation. Um, and so I, I'm going to go through a list of um, landscape uh, observations uh, without diving into great, great depth at all, just to give you a sense for the scope of this discussion. It's just enormous. So another issue is authentication. How do we know what devices are on the net? How do we know which ones they are, who they belong to? How do we know which parties are participating? Strong authentication and public key cryptography have turned out to be very important new tools for assisting with that. Another big issue is cost. Can I afford to get access to the internet, even if it's available? Uh, and of course, increased availability is coming from low Earth orbiting satellites, Starlink and others. Uh, and, uh, but the real question is, um, is, it, is it affordable? Uh, another issue is reliability and resilience. Uh, if it doesn't hold up, if it's not reliable, then people don't want to use it or won't want to depend on it. Or if they do depend on it, it will be uh, damaging. A third thing is whether or not it's fit for performance. Does it run fast enough? Is the latency low enough? There are other parameters that may be important uh, that might interfere with its utility. Sustainability is another question. Once it's in place, is, does, does it have a business model or does the ISP you're relying on have a business model? Does the application provider have a business model? So it's safe to rely on over long periods of time. What about safety and security and privacy? Uh, we, we all see the need for attending to those, and we've seen the important use of cryptography in support of some of those uh, desirable properties. Then we get to concerns about the abuse of the platform. The internet is a relatively neutral system, and unfortunately, it will amplify everything, including good quality as well as bad quality information, misinformation, disinformation, and the like, uh, and we need to cope with that somehow. Specifically, we have to worry about the abuse of the system that causes harm to others. And it's especially troublesome because the abuses can take place across international boundaries. And so one of the big challenges is figuring out how to respond to uh, something which might be considered a crime, which we now have to figure out what's by definition, what is a crime? Uh, what about norms of behavior, even if they're not uh, issues of criminality? Uh, we'd like people to observe norms that uh, civil that civil society would typically uh, want. Accountability is turning out to be increasingly important. We want parties who are using the internet to be accountable, but in order to hold them to account, sometimes we have to penetrate the veil of anonymity or pseudonymity in order to achieve that objective. Agency is another important element here. How do we give agency to people, to organizations, to countries? to protect themselves, to protect their citizens from potential hazards in the online environment. And by the way, these hazards occur in offline environments too. Uh, your laptop, even when it's not connected to the internet or your mobile, may still have become infected uh, with, uh, with malware and uh, therefore a source of uh, potential hazard. We also get into a really interesting legal uh, question when we're trying to deal with, uh, with harmful behaviors. And that's how we capture digital evidence and by what practices we achieve integrity, assurance of integrity, and chain of custody. If, if there's a digital object which is critical to some uh, court proceeding, how do we make sure we know where it came from and how well its integrity was preserved and by whom? The term data sovereignty has popped up. I think Miriam may have mentioned it in her introduction. I find the term uh, potentially hazardous. And the reason for this is that some people somehow think that by trying to build a firewall around a geopolitical space, that somehow or other you've protected that which is inside the firewall. I can assure you that this is not the case and that risk factors are high everywhere uh, in the internet. Uh, that means, however, you need to introduce different ways of protecting information if that's the purpose of data sovereignty. Cryptography is your friend here. Uh, as long as you encrypt data and only allow keys to go to authorized parties, 
it doesn't matter where the data is as opposed to trying to force it to be in some geopolitical location. Last two observations uh, are that uh, we really see a variety of abuses and hazards, misinformation and disinformation, denial of service attacks, bullying, malware, phishing, are all contributing to uh, hazards in the network and governance asks us to deal with that problem without destroying the utility that the internet has patently already shown to have, which is allowing people to find information, find each other, to gather and cooperate and collaborate. Last point is that we see fragmentation happening in this environment. Uh, and that uh, is a topic that was covered by a paper published in an earlier uh, IGF in 2013, uh, which I, I will try to uh, put into the chat uh, if I get a chance to do it during the course of this call. But Miriam, thank you so much for letting me carry on for a while. I'll turn this back over to you to introduce uh, more discussion among our colleagues. You're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, thank you, uh, Vin. This is a very, a very long list of uh, challenges and of uh, issues, very current uh, issues. I don't know how we can take all of this. Uh, Robin, maybe, uh, yeah, uh, Vin mentioned the um, cryptography issue and uh, also the malware and uh, uh, the use, more generally speaking, the use of data and their security is clearly one of the main internet governance issues and uh, also in terms of uh, fragmentation, possible fragmentation and the, the um, sovereignty issue. Do you see any new uh, developments in terms of uh, um, how this is negotiated uh, to, to adopt new standards in this, uh, in this regard? Uh, with regard to cryptography in particular, uh, well, the first answer is that uh, the big concern people have now is that with quantum computing coming along, the public key crypto um, current algorithms are at risk. Uh, and so post-quantum crypto algorithms have already been proposed and are being winnowed down by the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Uh, I think there are three or four now proposed possible standards for both digital signatures and also for strong cryptography. So, uh, so the answer is uh, that's the most important development, I would say, in the near term. Mm. Robin, th thank you. Robin, uh, maybe you want to comment on that too? Or sure. On the challenges? <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Um, we were asked to uh, pick an unresolved issue, and I did pick the issue of data security and standardization practice. And what I want to suggest today is that there is a persistent disconnect between the global policy debate about some of these issues and actual standardization practice. And to explain why I think that's a problem that we need to address. As today, uh, the buzzword, if you like, is achieving strategic autonomy uh, or digital sovereignty, which has been mentioned. And it's often referring to what some people call a new security imaginary. And what might this mean? In the West, it seems to be beginning to mean emphasizing state territorial boundaries and focusing on designated critical technologies. And basically, the aim is for the US and Western allies to achieve freedom from hardware and software dependencies on countries and companies that are perceived as security threats. Uh, this disconnect sees states as being in competition to build digital market leadership, to assure data security and privacy protection. However, in policy debate, quite often what you find is that states are treated typically as homogeneous actors with unambiguous positions on things like cybersecurity or how to treat uh, cryptography on internet freedom or on privacy issues. And what this neglects is within state tensions and the fact that standard setting operates internationally, regionally, and at the national level. And in practice, these are all interconnected. There are many actors, as we've already heard, besides states who are active in developing technical standards with the aim of achieving data security or privacy. So let me give you an example. Um, in my work with Jean-Christophe uh, 
Plantin at the LSE, we examined recently the history of 5G standardization and claims about how companies like Huawei and other Chinese companies' technical kit and standards threaten um, Western security. We looked at who is active internationally in developing standards, their ambitions, and coalitions that are trying to exclude China's participation in 5G standards development. Specifically, we looked at open RAM uh, standards. What did we find? We found that there was no big difference at the international level between the standards ambitions of the players, but big variations in who participates. We also found no clear separation between Western and Chinese approaches to standardization in this area. Of course, there is some fragmentation of standards, but the goals are not hugely different. Further, 5G standards implementation can create heightened risks of privacy intrusions, if you like, or surveillance in all countries. So there is a disconnect between the state-led policy and standardization practice, at least on the international level in this area. A second example of the disconnect that I'm pointing to is standards for data retention. The example here uh, is European states and the European Union say that they aim to safeguard citizens' data privacy, but the scope for mass state data collection is increasing. The disconnect here is visible in how metadata from online interactions is treated. In this case, standards refer to the criteria for determining who should be able to access metadata, who can hold such data, and for how long, and what constitutes a serious or sufficient threat to security. In Europe, the data retention directive was struck down by the Court of Justice of the European Union for failing to protect fundamental rights. The court said that data retention is justified only in cases of genuine, serious, and imminent threat to national security. But there is no clarity about the specific standards for determining what is a serious threat. We're talking here about metadata, which could be as simple as subscriber data, um, or IP addresses, which in fact are widely shareable. In both of these examples, there's a disconnect between policy and standards practice. Missing in, the, in investigation is investigation of what actors are seeking to achieve, how they are developing standards, and whether these standardization practices converge or diverge from the expectations of state actors. This kind of policy and standardization disconnect also exists when we speak of internet fragmentation or in internet freedom. A stronger coupling between policy and what happens in standard setting forums, some of which were mentioned by Vin, is imperative. Without it, policy claims about splinter nets versus global open internet ring a bit hollow. In the recent US Council of Foreign Relations Independent Task Force on Confronting Reality in Cyberspace, policy for a fragmented internet report came out a few weeks ago it concluded that in quotes the era of the global internet is over end of quote it calls for the us and its allies to move towards and quote again trusted protected internet uh, international communication platforms but how exactly do the technical standards to support this differ between the us and say china the report calls for a US-led coalition to promote the security of, for instance, open source software. The report mentions standards, but once again, there are no specifics. It is assumed that standards making practice will seemingly straightforwardly follow the policy agenda. So my main message, re unresolved issues, is that the disconnect between policy and standards making practice is way too big. Policy typically does not acknowledge how standardization practice actually works on multiple levels, with multiple stakeholders, with both convergent and divergent interests. These are, of course, sensitive issues. Yes, they are. There's no doubt about that. And Vint went through a whole list of um, issues to do where we need more accountability in internet governance. But addressing geopolitical tensions requires much greater understanding of technical standards making practices if we really want to have a globally working internet and the security of data flows. And I'll leave my intervention there. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Robin. This is a very uh, timely 
uh, you mentioned uh, five, with the uh, new technologies we developed, you mentioned 5G. Uh, we can also talk about uh, quantum computing and many um, new um, technologies de developing. And they are the subject of uh, discussions where sometimes you uh, cannot really distinguish where, where is the uh, the um, business interests and the uh, political economy, I mean, part of the discussion and the security interest, security of people or cyber security of people and also security and sovereignty of a uh, nation. So uh, these, the, we have seen such kind of uh, discussion and antagonism uh, at ICANN also for the management of domain name system. Uh, speaking of this uh, multi-stakeholder um, uh, environment, and uh, multi-stakeholderism has been uh, praised for for long. But what what about the challenge that are raised uh, by multi-stakeholderism in terms of uh, democracy and and the rule of law? And I'm turning here to Ian R. Scholte, uh, who uh, specialized, you know, in these uh, issues. And I would like to ask you, Ian, uh, whether we are seeing. Uh, a return of the state, as you uh, untitled uh, one of your uh, recent co-edited uh, uh, books, through this uh, new diplomatic practices in, uh, in the internet uh, arenas. Jan? Yeah. Thank you. Um... I do have a few slides, but I think they might go somewhere that you, you didn't entirely in, uh, intend, Miriam. But let's 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 see how it goes. Um, I am I should say, uh, as Miriam sort of said there, um, when I look at these unresolved issues and highly sensitive global internet governance challenges, I do so from the position of being a professor of global transformations and governance challenges. That's a that's a bit bit of a, a grand title, but it means that I'm not a technical expert at all. And what I tend to do is come at these issues in relation to global governance in general and global political economy. Um, I, so governance for, I understand this may be mainly a technical audience, so maybe the, the term governance is uh, a little bit up in the air. And although Miriam mentioned the definition that the WUSIS came across with, uh, governance is actually a concept in, in social analysis. Um, which talks about the regulatory dimension of social relations. So we're talking about what kind of rules we make for the internet in relation to its infrastructure, in relation to the data, in relation to the content. Um, so we're looking at how do you formulate and implement, enforce, review, and adjust rules for the internet. Um, and this term governance is particularly uh, chosen instead of government uh, in order to highlight that the making of rules for the Internet is not just done through the state, uh, but is done through uh, multiple other sites as well. What are the challenges for this? Um, I want to say that governing the global internet is something that, yes, wants to work out the various technical issues that have been mentioned by Vint and, and Robin already, but it's also in a broad, broader context. And my worry sometimes is that the internet governance scene uh, can lose sight of some of those wider issues of global political economy. So let me put them on the table and then uh, you can decide whether what you want to do with them. Um, it's questions about ecology, about distributive justice, about culture, peace, liberty, and democracy. Um, and I'll just give some quick illustrations of this because our time is short. But one of these areas is, is ecological issues. I find that these are almost never discussed in the internet governance arena, um, but the internet actually generates nearly 4% of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. We've just had the Sharm El Sheikh uh, uh, meeting on climate change. Um, and uh, in fact, you know, the, 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 the internet generates far more uh, greenhouse gas emissions than air travel, for example. So there's, a, there's some, some real issues to be looking at there. I always have to laugh at all the people doing the internet governance who jet set around the world making rules for the virtual world, but they actually prefer to meet physically. Um, anyway, we, there's, I, would, I would say there's a, a lot of issues uh, here in relation to the internet on ecological issues that I certainly would be happy to see on the agenda more. Um, Questions of distributive justice, uh, likewise, the internet is an enormous area of 
uh, contemporary capitalism. Uh, people talk about platform capitalism, information capitalism, and so on. And uh, so there's issues of distributive justice that come up with this as well. Uh, Vint already mentioned the questions about access, um, uh, mentioning and, and emphasizing uh, disability issues there. Um, one might also say uh, access by cultural life world. It took ages to get different scripts uh, uh, onto the onto the internet. We've now resolved that very uh, fairly well. Um, but there are other issues in, in, in that area. Is the internet uh, serving indigenous peoples in the same way? Is the internet uh, uh, available to, to, to men and women in the same way? Um, and so on. 30% of the world is uh, population is still not having regular access to the internet. So these are these are issues there. But distributive justice issues also in terms of competition policy. The big internet industry gi giants of today, you could liken them to the seven sisters of the oil companies of 100 years ago um, in some ways. These are big, big, big companies uh, uh, and uh, capturing very large amounts of, uh, of uh, contemporary uh, capital. Um, and do we need to ask questions about uh, about uh, breaking them up in the way that competition has arisen in the history of capitalism again and again as new as new fields open up? And is this one one that needs looking at in that regard too? Uh, questions have come up and mentioned already about the questions about keeping the uh, single interoperable unified uh, technical layer of the internet. Um, again, I don't necessarily need to repeat to what's already been mentioned uh, there. Um, what hasn't been mentioned as much is, is questions about, yeah, cultural vibrancy. And one hears voices from the margins of internet governance uh, asking for a decolonization of the internet. I think what they mean there is that um, there's, a, there's a risk on the one hand that arguments about an a technical apolitical one best way of doing the global internet and its governance may actually have unforeseen and not easily tracked uh, forces uh, that lead to losses or compromises of cultural diversity and assimilationism um and that in this world of dominant platforms where we get a deluge of content from them to such a degree that other kinds of content, other kinds of knowledge, other kinds of information get squeezed out of our consciousness uh, and do we lose something uh, there? Uh, indeed, do, do, does our cultural life get a certain shallowness when we uh, are living in a society of 140 characters? Questions about peace. The internet was uh, was was heralded as a as a as a as a uh, part of the uh, society of greater prosperity and peace at the late twentieth century. We now know and see that we have various ways that the internet opens up to violence, um, in its uses in warfare, uh, the hate speech, incitements to violence, internet as a tool of crime, and so on and so forth. There's a whole issue there. Matters of liberty, um, uh, shutdowns especially in Africa and South Asia, the content filtering and blockage that we see, surveillance and privacy violations have been mentioned already. The way that algorithms quietly can determine our experiences and sometimes even shape our senses of our own identity. Regulation and, and governance has often not looked fully into these areas that they just begin to be considered policy-wise. And then questions of democracy, which uh, which I think uh, Miriam, you 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 uh, allude to there with multi stakeholder arrangements. Um, multi stakeholder arrangements have been promoted as a kind of new democratic way of governing the internet. The idea that uh, if you have suitable representation from all of the groups who are affected by and affect the internet then you will somehow have constructed a, a new kind of democratic participation and control. Um, certainly, multi-stakeholder approaches have brought democratic innovations to global governance of the internet, uh, many of them very admirable. Uh, nevertheless, if one looks at patterns of participation in these arenas, then there clearly are hierarchies of influence, geopolitical, uh, very strong and often, one might argue, disproportionate influences from the business sector, um, worries about some capture 
uh, special interest capture of some of these processes. Uh, sure, there is a great open door, but if you cannot afford the airfare to get to the meeting, uh, a remote participation really is not an, an equivalent uh, to being to being there, as I think any of us who have uh, been on these corridors know. So, likewise, other areas, corporate self-governance, you know, oversight board from uh, from from Facebook and the like. Where is the public accountability in those constructions? They seek to preempt, I think, public sector regulation uh, in those areas. Uh, but whether they really achieve sufficient public accountability, I'm just uh, uh, not not sure. And even at the level of the state, if we look at how states are making their policies, uh, both authoritarian and liberal governments, uh, whether there's sufficient public accountability for what those states are doing in relation to the uh, internet and its governance is, I think, very much open to question. Um, I hope that gives some a few a few thoughts for for provocation. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ian. You are not uh, making our task uh, <laughs> easier because Vint already listed uh, uh, a long, uh, uh, big set of uh, challenges, and you added new challenges. And um, I see uh, more or less. I said uh, again, I'm getting old, but I see that most of these challenges are there since more than 20, 25 years, and especially uh, those around uh, um, democracy, human rights, the respect for the rule of law, etc. But maybe they are transforming because of new technologies, because of new, new issues. Uh, but the, the the challenge itself uh, um, has not uh, really changed. I see that uh, Vint is eager to <laughs> intervene on uh, what you said about ecological integrity, and also Jim uh, want uh, would like to show. Uh, maybe Jim, you should uh, start showing your slide. It could help the discussion. Discussion. Then Vint on. Uh, uh, greenhouses and um, uh, green computing, and then I would like to take uh, one question uh, in the in the chat in the Q and A chat. So please, Jim, uh, would you show your slide? Oh, sure. Great. First, I wanted I wanted to thank you all for really uh, fabulous and thought provoking presentations. There is so much on the table here. It's almost hard to believe, and 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 I wanted to actually address that issue of how much is on the table by just showing one slide, which actually I pulled out of a paper that Vint wrote uh, with a couple of co-authors, I think in 2014, which which I think Stavrula has posted on the chat. So I'm just going to share my screen for a second, and then I wanted to ask the panelists a, que a, a question uh, in in that context. So let me let me share my screen. And let me do this and let me do this. So, so this had to do with, you know, what, what, what networking people always do when the problem is big, you talk about a reference model so you can start to localize some of the questions. And this um, uh, paper at the bottom was one that Stavrula posted in the slide already or in the chat already. And, and so then I'm not sure these were exactly the names of the layers of the stack that you had in your paper. I may have translated them slightly, but you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, the standards, sort of the 5G standards, the, the, the technical standards. We talked about, people had mentioned ICANN and, you know, internet names and numbers. And then there's been a lot of discussion about this content layer, about, uh, I, Robin and Jan talked about that quite a bit, you know, the social uh, and the policy issues there. Um, and I just wanted to say that, Vin, I found this uh, layered reference model really useful in, in talking about questions that come up around internet governance. And I guess I, I wanted to ask two questions. I mean, my view is that this sort of goes from the technical to the, to the, to the social. And I, I guess a question I wanted to ask uh, is, is the following, and that is a lot of the discussions here been, has been mostly at the content layer. Is that where most of the, I don't know, I wanna say action is, and that at the infrastructure layer, the standards are sort of proceeding along and maybe with the names and numbers, there's things between uh, ICANN and ITU and things like that. But uh, 
you know, is most of the activity happening now higher layers in the architecture? That's that's one question. And maybe a question I'd pose directly to Robin, because I agree with her remark that the distance between standards and policy is so good, you know, is so big in this reference model. I mean, does that suggest, I don't know, um, uh, you know, interfaces between layers or how, how do you bridge that gap in this context? So I'll turn it over to the panel. I just yeah, wanted to yeah. show this picture Vint, from your paper. Yeah, uh, just before, right before Vint and, uh, and Robin uh, answer and comment, I think there is a, a question um, in the chat, in the Q&A, which is very much related to what you, sh you just showed, uh, Jim. Uh, the question is from Asan Gay. Uh, he said, um, uh, yes, the challenges, uh, I think he's, uh, Asan is a he, uh, the challenges have been uh, around since more than 20 years. Could it be the case that the very design structure of the internet is the problem? Should we consider another uh, paradigm? So we need another father of another internet, maybe. And uh, Hassan adds also, um, just to add more context, uh, anonymity is inherent to how the current internet was built. Uh, I'm not sure of this, by, by the way, but um, never mind. Is that the problem? So uh, we have also another question, but more related to network neutrality. So I will give the floor now to Vint and Robin to uh, answer on these uh, questions. <laughs> wow. This is sort of like, uh, describe the universe in 25 words or less. Please give three examples. Uh, so let me first uh, respond to uh, Jim's uh, layered question. I would say that although we use the term and you use the term content layer, let me say that that's the place where people use the underlying infrastructure. It's the application space. And that's where all the controversy is. How is this engine being used? And in what ways do we want to control or constrain its use? Uh, and how do we want to respond to what we consider abuse, for example? And so that's really uh, the layer where an awful lot of policy issues arise. There are technical policy questions as well. And there are places where the technology can be uh, interfered with to cause problems. So fragmentation, for example, can take place because of an inadequate security of the uh, border gateway protocol that allows routing of, of traffic through the public internet. Uh, if, you, uh, if you have false announcements, for example, you get traffic going where it doesn't belong. Uh, there's uh, the domain name system can be uh, interfered with if you don't use DNSSEC, which uh, digitally signs the mapping of the IP uh, address and the name uh, domain name that it's associated with. So there are a variety of places in the in the lower level technical uh, area where policy and technology need to work together to create a more secure environment. Um, let's see the the question about um, uh, just to come back to Jan's wonderful, uh, thought-provoking and provocative uh, presentation, uh, agent provocateur, uh, I would say, uh, and then you said, well, uh, the internet uses 3. or generates 3.7% of greenhouse gas. I just need to point out to you that this is electricity primarily, and uh, we use electricity for an awful lot of things. Uh, there's effort in the community, uh, in the industry, to drive uh, electrical requirements down, you know, by lower power chipsets and a variety of other things, operating at higher temperatures and so on, so that you don't need to evaporate so much cooling water and so forth. Uh, but I would argue that um, that the, the fact that it generates 3.7 percent of greenhouse gas should not be misunderstood as therefore it's a bad thing because in the absence of internet, our pandemic would have looked very different. So uh, let's be a little careful about the fact that we are so dependent on electricity, not just the internet, but electricity. Without it, and so many things don't work. Now, uh, with regard to redesigning the internet, I need to remind everyone that the design is 50 years old. Bob Kahn and I started the work in uh, 1973. This is many more than 20 years. Uh, and the answer is, of course, you could start over. The question is, would you come out with anything very different? And I would argue that for the most part, 
the technical standards that allowed for flexible interoperability of many, many different networks using many, many different kinds of technology is pretty hard to beat. And the fact that this system is still running and we're relying on it right this minute suggests that we must have gotten some of it right. Robin, please. Yes. Um, I think the first observation in response to the design issues around the internet and um, issues of layers uh, that I would make is um, 50 years ago, the internet was designed and it was uh, the protocols, et cetera, had compromises associated with them. Certain choices were made. They were operating in, you were operating in a, a particular environment, which is not now. And it would be very unusual on the face of the earth if everything stayed the same forever to manage our communicative environment, a part of which is the internet. And I think the point that I want to make is that values, as Jan said, are deeply embedded in the standards choices that are being made now, not necessarily at the core of the internet, but the way in which they're implemented. And that politics does matter. And I know that in some standard setting situations, that's quite a controversial statement to make. I was in a webinar just recently in which I was told point blank, there is standards over here, technical standards, and there are values over there. And we need to keep them apart. My position from an uh, expert in socio-technical um, evolution of infrastructures is very much that they are in some sense inseparable and that we do need to acknowledge and recognize that choices that are being made today around the internet's governance are being very particularized in the context of the wider geopolitics of the world, if you like, and that those tensions are percolating through whether explicitly or implicitly into certain choices that are being made, not necessarily to do with the core protocols of the internet, but with regard to a lot of what goes on and rides on it. And I think that's where we need to be concerned because there are very, very different conceptions of what kind of communicative infrastructure we need. And therefore my answer to the Laird question is it's not just all about content, although those are the topical issues and attracting a lot of attention. It's about all the layers of the internet and how they fit together and how the bottom layer inflects the top and vice versa. I'll stop there, thank you. So Robin, thank you. I'm sorry, Marian, it's Vin. Uh, just to respond, one thing that's really important to recognize is the notion of subsidiarity. And what's happening is that there are people who have concerns over content and use, uh, whether it's uh, you know, preventing people from criticizing the government or preventing people from being harmed by misinformation and disinformation. Some people try to use lower layer protocols inappropriately in order to solve a problem that should be a policy matter at a higher layer in the system. So I do worry about, uh, about that problem. And I do agree that there's plenty of politics uh, associated with standards making. Yeah, thank you. We only have um, three minutes left and I would like to read a, a very important question that we've got in the chat. Very important and very timely again, I, I should say, because it is related to network neutrality issue and network neutrality uh, is starting to be reconsidered uh, at least in the European Union the position so the question is from Blake Willis uh, uh, let me read it between the price of internet transit rapidly converging towards the cost of maintaining settlement free peering and incumbent uh, carriers lobbying for content taxes does the panel see a path towards ensuring that a massively interconnected internet remains economically viable? Who wants to take in one minute on uh, this question? Vin? I'll take a short, a short push and then, and then Robin, uh, I will say that the private sector, including my company, Google, is investing enormously in infrastructure mm -hmm. and capacity in order to offset the cost to other people of connectivity in the system. Uh, and briefly, the age old problem of who pays is very much inflected by there's always going to be legacy companies. So we have the telecoms operators and those who have built their infrastructures. And then we have the new, you can call them insurgents or the ones that have grown to significant size now. And 
they have a particular view about who pays. And this is a struggle, which will be, again, informed by some of the policy decisions that are made, whether in the EU or in the United States or around the world. And um, it's not clear who the winners will be, depending on which choices are made, if taxes are introduced or if um, various other kinds of policies are put in place to change the balance of who pays for which parts of the infrastructure, we could see a very different configuration of companies going forward in the future. Jan, do you want to add something on, on this question or any other? No. Not yeah. necessarily on this question, but I did want to respond to Jim's uh, uh, layered picture. And he said, is the mm -hmm. situation changing and does, is it looking different than it did in 2014? And I think maybe we would say that uh, there probably is more relative emphasis to what in your de de description there was at the content layer. Uh, I think maybe people would tend to put those two technical layers into one uh, technical, your, your two bottom, but maybe that's because you're coming from a more technical aspect. And then they would disaggregate the content part of the of the of the of the figure the other the other issue is perhaps the array of uh, institutions and actors that you named there in terms of the regulation of the field today uh, compared to 2014 i think in today's world there would be much more emphasis on state actors uh, alongside the uh, the non-state actors that are very prominent in the chart from 2014 so uh, uh, i think there would be some certain shifts but uh, that's the that's the nature of internet governance it's a it's a living beast it keeps changing by the day so you, it's really hard to keep track and no chart uh, is, is, is good for more than a couple of months. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we could continue this discussion, I mean, overnight and for days or months. And actually next, uh, next week at the IGF, the Internet Governance Forum, uh, set up uh, after the the UN uh, summit on the the information society, all these issues uh, will be uh, will be discussed um, at the international level and uh, through a multi stakeholder discussion. Uh, before handing over to our, our organizer, I would like to thank all my co panelists, Vint, Robin, uh, Ian. And just maybe an advice, capacity building is very important. Uh, capacity building of, uh, you know, the society uh, at large, our uh, governments, etc., but also capacity building in terms of political sci science, political stakes. And um, I have been teaching at the Sorbonne Université with uh, Serge, uh, our computer science uh, student, at the master level, I have been teaching internet governance and believe me, they don't know anything about that and they really need to uh, have uh, this kind of, uh, let's say 60 hour in a semester about internet governance to, to understand uh, uh, what is at stake because they are designing the internet. They are designing its protocols, its architecture, etc. So this is my advice. Thank you all. And I'm handing over to uh, Serge and, and Jim. Thank you for inviting us uh, for this this uh, panel. Great. Thanks, Miriam and Vint and Robin and Jan uh, for a really fabulous hour here. I mean, it was really, really thought provoking and it was really great to see the questions come in and actually some of the references uh, that showed up by chat. So I wanted to thank everybody again. Um, I wanted to remind everybody here who's online that uh, the networking channel events happen every two weeks uh, at the same time. And to say that, uh, let me just put up one slide here to talk about um, what's coming up in two weeks. So you can all, so you can all see it. Two weeks from now, uh, we have Ramesh, Ramesh Siddharaman, who's a distinguished university professor at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And for the purposes of this talk, probably most importantly, he's the chief consulting scientist at Akamai Technologies. And he, in the next event, he'll be talking about living on the edge for a quarter century and Akamai retrospective and sort of start with the content distribution aspects and then how Akamai evolved towards edge computing. Um, um, Miriam mentioned that you know we, we do a lot of uh, different 
types of programs in the networking channel. We've did we've done some that have been a little bit more. This is how it works based. So we did a. This is how Netflix works. This is the Google network, um, and this is maybe one in you know sort of along those lines as well. So we're all looking forward to having Ramesh come and talk two weeks from today. So I want to thank our panelists uh, once again and thank Vincent Vin and. Uh, Miriam in particular uh, as the organizers and hope to see everybody here in two weeks. Thanks. <laughs>